we're going to cut off a Medicare, that would be really our only choice. But when we look at the positive deviants, the ones who are getting the best results at the lowest costs, we find the ones that look most like systems are the most successful. That is to say, they found ways to get all of the different pieces, all of the different components to come together into a whole. Having great components is not enough, and yet we've been, been obsessed in medicine with components. We want the best drugs, the best technologies, the best specialists, but we don't think too much about how it all comes together. It's a terrible design strategy, actually. <laughs> um, if you, well, there's a famous thought experiment that touches exactly on this. They said, what if you built a car from the very best car parts? Well, it would lead you to put in Porsche brakes, a Ferrari engine, a Volvo body, a BMW chassis, and you put it all together, and what do you get? A very expensive pile of junk that does not go anywhere. And that is what medicine can feel like sometimes. It's not a system. Now, a system, however, when things start to come together, you realize it has certain skills for acting and looking that way. Making systems work is the great task of my generation of physicians and scientists. But I would go further and say that making systems work, whether in healthcare, education, climate change, making a pathway out of poverty, is the great task of our generation as a whole. In every field, knowledge has exploded, but it has brought complexity, it has brought specialization. And we've come to a place where we have no choice but to recognize, as individualistic as we want to be, complexity requires group success. We all need to be pit crews now. Thank you. So, Nick, you've been looking at integrated care in many places around the world, and you've seen many versions of implementing it. So what does it mean to you? If you think about it, in today's systems, uh, they're really uh, uh, failing people in many different respects, particularly people with older people with, with complex care needs. And the fragmentations uh, in today's systems really make it very difficult um, uh, for certain cohorts of people to, to live independently and live, live, live active and healthy, healthy lives. And this is due to a number of different reasons. It's, it's partly because there are lots of different uh, uh, providers and professionals in the system who are providing care in silos, they're not coordinating uh, 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 efforts. Uh, and at the same time, uh, people are, are having to manage their own care without uh, the support and the ability to be able to do so. So integrated care in that sense really means overcoming those fragmentations and supporting a process where uh, you have a, a person-centered approach that coordinates care around their needs, enables them to live um, more um, independently, enables them to manage their chronic illnesses more appropriately. It means they have uh, less need for institutionalized care or, or specialist support. So it's, it's all about that process. It's about getting, it's get, getting the care when they need it and supporting them to live well. So what are some things that a clinician or a health system manage, health service manager can do with their own clinical team and with their own practice as a starting point to make it happen? I, I think there are a number of prerequisites for doing integrated care well in, in primary community care. Uh, and, and the first one is that you need to be able to create a, a, a strengthened primary care service where, where, where GPs are working in a team-based environment with uh, advanced care nurses uh, or other professional roles who are supporting them uh, to manage people with complex needs more effectively uh, because these individuals require more than just uh, a medical consultation. They might require support with assisted living in the home, they might require help with uh, a, a mental health issue, uh, it might be not just related to the patient but also their care and family. There are all sorts of things that influence the ability of a person with chronic illness to manage their own care. And unless you're working in a team-based environment, 
um, then it becomes more problematic for a GP to be able to provide all of the response that is, is necessary to support that person. So this requires a number of different capabilities. Uh, it means, uh, on the first hand, being able to find someone who's able to go into a person's home or to be able to provide some sort of support uh, to enable them to understand how to live with their condition, to understand how to manage their medications, to potentially uh, get some support from peer groups or others in the local community who might be able to support them outside of a clinical consultation. But at the same time, it's the GP's ability to be able to extend their primary healthcare team, work in networks with other organizations in order to be able to draw down that additional support uh, in a way that can do it. And it, it, it doesn't have to be rocket science. It can be really quite simple. And, um, you know, uh, uh, GPs do integrated care all the time. What we're talking about in our version of integrated care for someone who has complex needs is that you need to have a range of other services and a range of other professionals available to do it more effectively for the people with those complex chronic illnesses. So David, tell us what's been happening down in Canterbury. Well back in 2007 uh, there was a growing realisation that Canterbury Health System couldn't keep functioning the way that it uh, was if it was going to meet the needs of the um, the needs and the challenges of the future. And the beginning part of that was starting to say, so what does the future look like if we carry on doing what, we, what we're doing? We'd have to build another hospital the same size as the current Christchurch Hospital, which is about five or 600 beds, uh, another 2,000 aged care um, beds, mm -hmm. and about another 20% GPs. And a bit of a sense of actually, even if we had the resources, the reality of being able to do that was not going to be um, was you not mean going you to be real. Be able to find the staff even couldn't if you had the money. Couldn't find the staff even if we had the money. So it, the trick with that is is converting a different language for a different sector into a health language, and the health language that we've used is patients' time. If how do we value the patients' time? And within that, actually, the biggest wastage we've got in health is patients' time because we cunningly experts at designing waiting into every part of a system we've got. And we have people bouncing from one part of a health system to another. And being able to get that language of wastage and patient's time, that, I guess, became one of the, um, you know, kind of the enablers right. of being able to say, well, actually, no, we've got and we can learn from others. So is it almost a sort of backwards round discovery? If you stop wasting the patient's time, you stop wasting the staff's time as well. Yep. The thing gets more efficient. And actually, there's a funny thing is we find we've got enough resource. At the same time, one of the things that's impressed me down here is you've got this slogan, so to speak, one system, one budget, when the reality is there is not one system, one budget. I mean, you do have the advantage of funding both health and social care. You've got general practice out there separately. You contract for an awful lot of your community nursing and other sorts of things. Mm -hmm. You have to contract with your labs and your radiology. Uh, so, and there's at least two public funders and yep. there's a lot of co-payments. So in a sense, it's not one system. In, in reality, it's not. But until people feel as though they are part of one system, yep. Why would I change what I'm doing? Yeah. How do I interact? Or why would I interact? And um, so by creating a sense of belonging under that you're part of one system, mm -hmm. the reality is um, we've still only got one dollar that we can spend anywhere in the system. Mm -hmm. um, so getting people understanding that there's no sense bouncing people around from one place to another mm -hmm. because we're shooting ourselves collectively in the foot. And what's been the result of all this? What's, what can you give me some examples of things that have changed in the way you do things? Mm. A lot of things have changed radically. I think the biggest part is the re-engaging and the re-professionalising those that work within health, that sense of pride that we can do, that we are architects of the health system. Mm. And if I put my discretionary effort into something today, I'll change something tomorrow. And that's probably been one of the most powerful things that we have um, been able to um, to. Um, bring to life. That's also then enabled a, a, a real sense of the single system and one budget. So what we've done is we've stopped or removed a lot of the barriers between whether you're primary care, secondary care. The debates and arguments are not now about funding or contracts. They're at, about how do we make this better for the patient and how do we reduce time. So that's the fundamental part of anything we do is now underpinning that. There are many ways people seek to try and improve public services generally and health in particular. Would it be fair to say the main thing that's happened here has been building the capacity inside the, inside the organisation and outside the organisation in other parts of the health system to try to actually introduce, to get 
professionals and individuals themselves to introduce mm. change? Has that been the key to, piece of what you've been doing? It has been. To get sustained change, um, it, it can't be done to. You've actually got to have those that work in the system, and in this particular case, the Canterbury Health System, believing they can make a difference, that they can really reshape and redesign the way they're doing things. And um, to have you know, targets, yes, they have a place, but if that's the only thing you're responding to, you're going to miss the point, mm -hmm. and um, it will get in the way of integrating systems uh, because the focus is always on single or um, siloed parts um, of a health system. The importance of building the capability, the importance of long-term um, investment in building that capability is really essential. Mm -hmm. And it also builds that sense of reconnection, that sense of pride, that sense of can do, that sense of actually there's nothing we can't do. Um, we may not know the answer, we may not have the solution, but actually we know the problem and collectively we'll get our heads around that in one form or other, mm. using lots of different inputs. Um, to, um, to help us on that journey. And in getting these changes to happen, how crucial has primary care been? And how crucial has the way it's linked into the system been? Mm. Really fundamental. One of the, one of the real strengths um, that we've built off in Canterbury is a long history of organised general practice. Um, but as with anything, you get parts, whether it be primary care or general practice or hospital um, part of the system, out of balance you end up with conflict. In terms of getting that sense of equal parties, equal partners, um, that's where you turn the real power of organised primary care into a major, major part and stakeholder in the way that um, hospitals are operating. And likewise, hospitals feeling they're part of and have got a sense of ownership with um, primary care. So from what we know and what is proven, okay, so known and proven around the world, it's proven that a really effective primary care system, and I would say small p, small c, so not necessarily doctor-centric, but some effective community-based partnering with people around decisions and education and cheerleading and support over time. We know that works yes. all around the world, all kinds of settings. We know that if you build upon that, you're going to get your most effective bang for your buck in terms of financial investment. So if you, in, in our sort of modern society, if you were to design a system based on the science that works optimally, you'd have a really effective long-term primary care system. The next layer, the, the cognitive specialist, so the cardiologist, the pulmonologist, the HIV specialist, the gold standard would not be third next available appointment in five days. It would be 90% of responses available in five minutes. Okay? Because yes. remember that longitudinal platform is occurring. So if I'm seeing someone with congestive heart failure issues, a little bit complicated, I need a little bit of help, the customer owner needs a little bit more expertise than I've got. If the cardiologist can be available on video or phone immediately looking at the same electronic health record, probably if they're complicated already knowing them to some degree, mm -hmm. can interact with us virtually and if they need a little examination whatever, I can do that. Yes. We can connect up a stethoscope, they can hear the heart sounds remotely through the video thing. They don't need to see the cardiologist hardly ever in person. If that cardiologist will be available within five minutes when they're needed to consult in an interaction with the longitudinal platform primary care and the person in the room. Proceduralists? So, so that's integrated care in, the, in, in your system? We're not there yet. Some of our, like our cardiologists get this. Uh, they would never admit publicly they have a five minute standard, but kind of off the record they do because they know that's what works. <laughs> so we talk about, but, sorry. But then hospital, is another thing. So what do we do in hospitals? We bring people in, we make them completely passive and dependent. We do things to them. And then at the time of discharge, we say, here's a whole bunch of pills. Here's a whole bunch of instructions. Don't screw it up when you go home or we'll call you non-compliant. We don't quite say it that way, but pretty close. Mm -hmm. And instead, we've got them confined for days. Their loved ones are there hanging out with them. Why don't we spend 50% of our effort in hospitals optimizing self-care and family care while they're in a teachable, observable learning environment? So 50% of hospital care should be maximizing self-care and family care while in the hospital so that at the time of discharge, you're already doing all your own self-care and family care by the time you're discharged. If you were admitted for an exacerbation of a chronic problem, then the follow-up immediately post-discharge is the most important variable for whether you bounce back, get readmitted, and how well you do at the time of discharge. So why aren't all discharges for uh, chronic conditions handled on the receiving side rather than the sending side. So pull discharges by the receiving side out of hospitals. Meaning primary care and longitudinal platform needs a very big presence 
during the hospital stay and the time of discharge. Now, we don't do any of that in our system yet, no. but it's part of the system we're trying to build towards. So the patient is still part of one team, and that team for a brief period of time includes the hospital yeah. stuff. But the the longitudinal team... platform is never disrupted. Yes. Everything else is built on supporting, helping, and intervening intensively when needed, but that longitudinal platform is never disrupted. Yes. Now, we're not there yet. No. That's not what we do, but it is part of our philosophy and where we're trying to build towards and get to. But we're not there yet. I think, I think your um, challenge in the UK has been the geographic separation of primary care and specialty care. And as you go forth in integration, uh, closing that gap between uh, the surgery in the, in the community and the hospital and the specialist Closing that gap is the challenge. So when we talk about integration, can I just be clear on this? The benefits really accrue from clinicians working more closely together, from services coming together. It's not about massive organizational change. No, exactly right. I mean, uh, it, if it isn't happening at the individual patient level, um, happening at the agency level isn't is irrelevant. So it's got to happen at the individual level and, 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 and that means that, that, that provider behaviors are going to have to change.